We're live now, and I'd like to welcome everyone to another uh, version of the Psych Genomics Consortium Worldwide Lab Meeting. Um, we're exceptionally fortunate. I'm super pleased to have Dan Geschwind of UCLA uh, uh, talking, uh, speaking for us today. Um, this is particularly timely, given that um, a whole stack of the Psych Encode papers came online yesterday in Science, and Dan was one of the key people involved with that. So we're super interested in hearing what he has to say. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to him. Dan, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, it's probably it's uh, still morning here, but I'm sure it's a lot of different times if there's anybody else on other than Pat and I. So um, um, this is the first time I've done this, so please uh, send me a note or message if, if you're not hearing it properly or have questions. Um, I'm happy to take clarifying questions as we go along, but kind of bigger uh, thought questions may be better to um, save to the end. So, you know, essentially what I'm going to talk about is, um, you know, uh, I'm going to give kind of like an overview of, you know, uh, I think sometimes you can't get these overview uh, from just reading people's papers. So, uh, so that's what I'm going to try to do today. And I'm going to talk about some of our thoughts about, um, you know, and some of the approaches that we've been using and uh, comments and criticism is, uh, of course, always welcome. Although no hard math questions, as my son would say. Um, so um, this is my conflict of interest. Um, the uh, Ovid is a company making drugs for orphan diseases, axial microbiome, Falcon Computing, a hardware company. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today doesn't have relationship to these, but I do want to disclose them. So, you know, as, as uh, about, um, I would say around 2012 or so, um, we started uh, I, th I think it became fairly evident uh, to people that um, a lot of the genetic risk for um, brain disorders was going to sit in non-coding regions, um, although not exclusively, but that it would be very helpful to have a map so that one could begin to understand how things were working. And I kind of view maps as both structural and kind of functional maps in that regard. And it's kind of a metaphor for what we're trying to do. And in thinking about brain development, it was clear that that was an area, especially human brain development, where there were really no maps for these territories. And um, that's not my title. That's actually the title. Um, that's something I've stolen from a, a, a friend of mine who's a movie uh, my wife and I helped produce that was uh, on William Gibson, the science fiction writer who uh, coined the term cyberspace. And um, the, the movie was called No Maps for These Territories. But whenever I'm doing this work, this psych -enco type work, I think of this uh, title. You can see uh, my now 18 year old son in this as uh, one of the first stunt babies, um, Jonas Scooch Geschwind. Anyway, enough for that. But uh, for those of you who are science fiction fans, it's kind of an interesting documentary. Um, and I am a science fiction fan. So what I'm going to talk about today is genetic risk for autism. And uh, just very, very briefly, most of you uh, know this as well as I do, but I just want to introduce it. Then we'll move into um, the notion of convergence, the fact that we have heterogeneous and complex genetic origins. And um, we have to ask, I think it begs the question, are we going to be treating a thousand different disorders with thousands of different drugs, or is there going to be some kind of convergence that will be helpful to us? Now, that's a very big question, but even the smaller question of, is there kind of convergence somewhere? Are there particular epochs or cell types or circuits that are particularly vulnerable? I think that becomes a very important question, not just for treatment, but potentially in terms of prevention. And so, um, and, and, and then the, set, the third point is understanding the mechanisms through which genetic risk factors act necessitates having these tissue specific maps of gene regulation. And so I'm gonna be focusing entirely on developing human brain. The psych encode work that we did with Mark Gerstein actually involved chromatin maps and other maps from adults. So I'll, I'll describe briefly the 3D chromatin structure, looping high C, the open chromatin with ATAC-seq, EQTL work that's unpublished that just came out in BioArchive within the last month. And our, um, again, the same, we have a BioArchive paper with 
of 40,000 single cell transcriptomes that I'll just briefly allude to, but I'm, I'm drawing your attention to these papers because they're not yet published in the, uh, uh, let's say, commercial uh, um, literature, they're, they're, but they are in bioarchive and it can be hard to find things there. So I thought I'd point your attention to them. So, you know, from, from any uh, developmental neurobiology perspective, um, autism is a neurodevelopmental syndrome that uh, clinically overlaps with many others and has as its kind of most specific definition involvement of um, an impact on social cognition and mental flexibility. And, um, but that's a non-etiologic definition. It's a behavioral and cognitive definition. And, um, you know, for a long time, I would say what it, our first EQTL paper that came out in 2001, the linkage paper, we've always had the notion that there's an aspect to risk for autism that lies on a continuum with normal variation and that is going to be dimensional involving, at that time, language was a core component. It no longer is, but I think it's still quite, quite relevant. You can think of risk as a continuum and autism being a very broad developmental syndrome. Those of you who have had kids or seen kids develop know that between age zero and three, social cognition and uh, mental flexibility are as what, you know, if you added sensory motor integration um, and language would be almost everything that's, uh, you know, that's going on. So this is a broad syndrome from a diagnostic rubric standpoint. So it should be no, um, uh, a surprise to anybody that it's extraordinarily heterogeneous from an etiologic standpoint as well. The notion here, again, is that part of the risk lies in, you know, these dimensional risks like social cognition and will intersect with, with aspects that affect social cognition in the general population. And if you're in the red zone on these contours, either because of environmental or a combination of genetic insults, on all three of them, and now on two of them, social behavior and repetitive restrictive behavior, which is another way of, of, of talking about the mental flexibility piece of things. Um, um, it's just shorthand for a very complex um, kind of set of behavioral issues, um, but that really focus on having abnormal increased repetitive restrictive behavior and a, and a real um, aversion to changing of routines. That's really what distinguishes autism, but you know, of course, uh, 10 to 15% have epilepsy at some time in two different epochs, maybe 30% have intellectual disability, but in no way is intellectual disability a defining feature of autism. That's very, very clear. So one way, you know, again, so you can think of this kind of a, you know, contour of normal distribution, but you can also think in another way that, um, you know, that anything that is causes an impediment to normal brain development, this notion of canalization. Um, you know, Waddington formulated it with regard to an epigenetic landscape, but we, you know, you know, kind of broaden that notion to think about, you know, the fact that there are no kind of, you know, there may be things that are specifically um, increased risk for autism more than intellectual disability. We definitely uh, believe in that, of course, and autism over other neurodevelopmental disorders. But the genes themselves aren't kind of autism genes or schizophrenia genes. The, you know, the, the formulation is that these are genes that, involved, that, that, that are involved in the development, um, um, elaboration, and function of uh, brain circuits, and that um, when you have a sufficient genetic or environmental risk um, that disables you from being... I would say, um, you know, being resilient and, you know, you could think of it in the other way uh, to, you know, to insults, then you end up with, uh, you know, with one of these neurodevelopmental disorders. So this notion that it's, it, uh, these genes are impacting normal development and that's how their, their impact is felt. So we think about this as a neurodevelopmental disorder, but we also don't expect that especially things that have large impact on risk are going to be specific to autism because those by their nature are things that have large effects on early brain development. So most of you know this already. Um, I, I, I'm just gonna summarize this. Um, there's strong evidence for 
a substantial contribution from de novo risk, both uh, copy number variants and uh, single nucleotide variants that disrupt protein coding regions, especially in genes that are highly constrained. None of these are common, none account for more than 1%, but additively, they probably account for uh, all of these kind of rare, from syndromic to copy number variants to de novo SNVs, probably you know 15% plus or minus. But that the majority of risk is predicted to be common inherited, and there's a whole bunch that's unaccounted for. Um, and so the idea is many genes don't account for more than 1%, highly additive effects, you know, strong pleiotropy. This is the, you know, the rule. And so again, um, my framing of this as a, you know, as a neurologist and developmental neurobiologist um, in my training is that at some level, if you're going to be asking about, co you know, convergence, it, it, it's obvious because this disorder is defined by social cognition that social circuits have to be disrupted, but it doesn't mean that they have to be disrupted specifically, just that they have to be disrupted. So you can have genes that act generally throughout the brain, but if they have a predominant effect or a substantial effect like TSC or FMR1 on frontal striatal, frontal temporal, frontal parietal circuits that we know are involved in social cognition, that will predispose to autism. But the question that we've been asking um, is not that anatomical question, although it is interesting that some of the genes that have been identified clearly lead to disconnection of some of these critical brain circuits. So it's, an, it's a very nice kind of confluence of the imaging phenotype and genetics. But the real question that we've been asking is not whether, you know, it's the brain regions, because we take that as a given, but is there molecular convergence or biological pathway convergence. And that's, that's essentially what we've been asking over the last decade, um, trying to ask. So again, you know, the way to, you know, again, this is um, um, old hat to most of you. Um, this is really meant for a neurobiology audience, but the notion that um, we're trying to connect all these levels and that's quite a bit distinct than, um, you know, trying to, uh, um, you know, then uh, some, some simpler organ systems where the function is actually understood. Uh, you know, we know what the heart is doing. It's pumping blood and, you know, in, in different ways, essentially it has, uh, you know, and we know a lot of, you know, so we have a, a kind of model of its function that helps inform uh, the uh, mechanism of, of genetic disruption. But here, here we really don't yet. So, the, you know, we've thought, you know, you know, the crucial thing will be to connect through these molecular hierarchies through to circuits and behavior. And we've taken an approach that historically is fundamentally focused on mRNA because it's measurable. We can do it in high throughput at high dynamic range. So we're getting a fairly complete picture with this, whereas we can't yet do that with protein. Um, but of course, we're interested um, in all of these different levels. So I don't want it to be taken, as some people do sometimes, that, oh, we think the transcriptome is the be-all be all and end-all, which is just not the case. It's just a very practical place that we found ourselves. And then, of course, genes don't act alone. They act in uh, pathways and circuits. They're co-regulated in many different ways, and there are a lot of different ways to look at this. We're looking at it, you know, one of our fundamental ways of looking at it relates to co-expression, so that genes that are co-expressed together function together. We can identify the clusters or modules using a variety of different methods. We usually apply WGCNA, but we've used many others as well. They all, you know, essentially converge. Um, and um, from identification of these modules, you go from tens of thousands of genes to, um, you know, dozens of modules that, that uh, summarize a biological function. And one of the early insights was uh, a, a graduate student in the lab at the time, Mike Oldham, who, who also just had a recent paper that followed up on this brilliantly in uh, Nature Neuroscience, um, where they, you know, were essentially, when you think about profiling tissue, the main source of variance is cell types. So when you profile tissue from hundreds of people, you're going to be able to do an in silico dissection and pull out cell type specific gene expression patterns. And that's what's shown here in C in terms of the module relationships. But you can also pull out things that aren't cell types like synapses. You'll pull out 
um, um, other cellular components that are co-regulated, like proteasome, mitochondria, ribosome, et cetera. So you really, you know, you find that these modules most of the time correspond to um, critical biological processes. And uh, another point that really helps with this is the fact that what we're looking at are scale-free networks, not exponential networks. And uh, without, you know, I'm realizing I'm taking a long time here, so I'm just going to summarize. A small number of nodes have a large number of connections. Most nodes have very few connections, and the few highly connected nodes are essential for the integrity of the network. So we both have the modular organization, um, which is kind of hierarchical, as well as scale-free. Um, it's kind of a hybrid, as well as this, this um, sense that within modules, uh, you know, the kind of hub genes are going to be very important. In fact, if we take the first principal component of gene expression in a, you know, in a module, it usually will correspond almost, uh, you know, very highly to the expression of the top, uh, you know, 10 or 20 genes. So the first question, uh, you know, that I'm going to go to is something that Neil Parikshak asked when he was a grad student in the lab, which is when and where do disease risk genes act? And the question was, we had brain span um, RNA sequencing data from um, you know, early embryonic days in cerebral cortex to about um, all the way through the lifespan. Um, but we just went through the first few years of life because we knew that autism risk was there because at that time, autism diagnosis depends upon um, being diagnosed before age three. Um, and, and, and so this, you know, the signs and symptoms are there prior to age three. We did cerebral cortex for one really critical reason, is that we knew that there were other less complete, but other cortical gene expression data sets out there that we could use to validate the modules we had. So another kind of rule of the kind of work that we do is that when we do a network analysis, we always make sure that what we're finding is reproducible and visible in other data sets. Um, secondly, if the modules are, contain a lot of protein coding genes, that they're typically about two thirds to three quarters of the modules will, will also be enriched in known PPI. That's not a, a rule, but we're generally, if we look at a co-expression network overall, it should almost certainly be enriched in PPI. And if it's not, um, uh, you have to think about, you know, it's what you're actually looking at, what the grand truth is. So, um, so anyway, this is the study. So the idea is you start with a genetic, you know, so we took at the time, there were, I think at the time, um, it was 2012, there were a series of papers um, from uh, a number of groups that showed uh, three of them published in Nature, and I think there were nine uh, de novo variants that met uh, the criteria of FDR less than 0.1 at that time. There were also a whole bunch of de novo mutations and highly constrained genes that had high probability but weren't certain. So we kind of put those into the, um, you know, into the top category. So, you know, the arrows here basically represent kind of, you know, their cartoon for effect sizes. So we looked at those that are presumed to have larger effect sizes, the de novo mutations. Um, um, then, um, you know, we can look at those that, um, that might be inherited or, or um, you know, smaller effect size, et cetera. And then we had a whole bunch of candidate genes that were on the Safari website with different levels of evidence, some based on um, monogenic medical genetic conditions and others based on candidate gene studies and the, and the GWAS that had been done to that point, which wasn't that um, illuminating. So what, you know, you know, just to make a kind of long story short, and then I'll show a few details is that we created networks based on normal human cortical development and then asked where do these different forms of risk that we knew at that point sit? And we, you know, so we have reproducible modules that are um, reproduced both in other data sets and in PPI. And now we ask, and we showed that those correspond to very basic biological pathways and trajectories that are known to go on during neurogenesis. And then we asked, where does the risk sit? And we could see that most of the large effect risks sat in um, one or two modules that were annotated as being involved in neurogenesis, chromatin modification, and transcriptional regulation. And so this will show you, you know, in essence, here are the modules. Those are the papers at the bottom right. 
that we took the list from. We looked at protein disrupting de novos, missense mutations, protein disrupting plus missense. At this point, there wasn't much of a missense signal in the data, but we reasoned that if we could identify modules that in which de novo variation was increased, that missense mutation should be close in network space to those genes. That's indeed what we saw. And we saw it was a non-random enrichment that these two modules, M2 and M3, were enriched, as well as this module M16. And I'm going to focus mostly on M2 and M3 just for a brevity's sake. This is a published paper now, and, and now, wow, five years old. So, you know, I mean, one of the other critical things is that we, ask, we also have to have something to compare it to. And there had been a couple of, I think in the uh, Roque paper, they really didn't have a sense of, of, of what, the, what the siblings looked like, right? You know, and so, so we have to be really careful because um, uh, rare variants that, are, that disrupt genes are, you know, present in, in all of us. So, so there, this is what that enrichment looked like. We didn't see a similar enrichment. And actually, when we looked at intellectual disability genes, Neil curated 400 from the literature that are Mendelian forms of intellectual disability. And we saw a very similar pattern to what you're seeing right here in the siblings. So it looked like at, at one level that these networks separated autism from intellectual disability and, and, and from their probands, uh, uh, from their siblings, unaffected siblings. Um, so does that, yeah. And, and, and so, um, so now what does that mean? So shown here is the first principal component on the left of uh, gene expression, red line is birth. And this is again, a normal developmental module that is enriched for gene ontology scores, you know, highly enriched, you can see those enrichment Z scores or kind of DNA binding and modulation of transcription. And these are showing the protein interaction uh, maps from DAPL. And then there's uh, M2 and M3. And they're very interesting. They, they peak uh, both between, you know, around uh, very, very early in gestation, really um, during a very early part of cortical neurogenesis. M2 being a kind of broader, clear neurogenesis. Neurogenesis begins in the cortex around eight to nine weeks and goes through you know, ekes out to, let's say, 24 weeks. Um, so you can really see this is a, you know, the left is a strong, you know, is really fitting with a cortical neurogenesis. And this other one is a much earlier, but, but um, the, that's probably related to, you know, we would say uh, progenitor proliferation. It really fits with the huge expansion of intermediate uh, progenitors. And uh, you can see the PPI being enriched. And what was interesting here, you know, as an aside, is that topoisomerase 1, which was not a co-expression hub, but is a protein interaction hub, is really, um, uh, um, which had been shown to transcribe, you know, long genes and um, a lot of autism risk genes, turns out to be the hub of M2. Um, and you can see other interesting genes that are involved in protein synthesis and gene regulation, including TSC2. Another observation here, was that you can see the SMARCs, SMARC CC2 one, those are all part of the BAF complex, which the Crabtree lab had shown is a chromatin modifying complex that had 26 known uh, subunits. We identified that seven of them had rare de novo mutations. That was highly significant. So we had evidence that this BAF complex involved in neurogenesis is likely to be harboring, you know, um, affected. Arid 1B is also part of that too. And then if we look at the kind of other risk, the kind of risk from, um, you know, Safari, again, this, this uh, genetic risk had much less evidence for it, but, but, you know, and probably contains a lot more noise than the first list, uh, without a doubt. But we see that this is also expressed prenatally. There's M16 is one there. And, and, and that these genes, um, and, and what's really interesting, if you were a a neurobiologist, you can see that, you know, kind of synaptic transmission is the latest, that's M13. The earliest is this M16, which is homocelic, homophilic cell adhesion, which is involved in kind of cell migration and early dendritic and axon outgrowth, and then kind of synapt, you know, the, the machineries for synaptic transmission and channels gets, uh, starts getting built, and then actually vesicle release and recycling and, and uh, 
you know, synaptic function, which is M13. So it was pretty interesting to look at these trajectories. And what we found here was that these were not only enriched in some of the, you know, this kind of, you know, more fuzzy uh, safari related, uh, you know, candidate autism genes, but also was substantially enriched for genes that are down-regulated and have neuronal uh, gene ontologies in, in postmortem autism brain. This was from a 2011 paper where we showed that about 70% um, of the autism cases had a kind of shared transcriptomic pattern that was pretty uh, surprising to me at least because um, of the genetic heterogeneity. We did not expect to see this kind of uh, transcriptional heterogeneity. Another thing we could do is begin to ask, now these were with pretty limited data sets, when and where these genes are expressed in terms of laminae, what kind of cell types? There weren't cell type specific gene expression data sets other than ones that we pulled from networks at that time. But what we're showing here is on the left in E data from the Allen Institute where Jeremy Miller and colleagues microdissected human fetal cortex. And F is a paper, some work that we did with Amy Bernard and Ed Lean at Allen, microdissecting um, using laser capture the macaque adult cerebral cortex. And what one can see is the kind of enrichment of M3 in uh, the progenitor zones as, as might have been predicted given the BAF complex and all of those neuroprogenitor genes. Um, um, M2 being enriched in kind of uh, more intermediate cells on the kind of later synaptic modules being enriched in, in the cortical plate um, and subplate, which is where the postmitotic neurons are. So that kind of makes sense in a way. Um, and then when we look in, in adult cortex, again, that is a caveat. Um, we can see that these modules are preferentially enriched in upper layers and not lower layers. The upper layers of the cortex, especially in human, layer two, three, and in some regions, four, two, three especially, are the layers that are predominantly responsible for cortical, cortical, and interhemispheric connections. Whereas in humans, layer five and six primarily project, almost exclusively in primates, project down out of the cortex. In mice, it's a little bit different. There are quite a few layer five neurons that project interhemispherically. Um, um, and then when we compare this to intellectual disability genes, both of these patterns, Again, we can see that they're quite different. Um, and so uh, these are, this is a permutation-based analysis where we look both at, at, at the fetal and the adult pattern, and we can see a very distinct, uh, very different laminar enrichment. In fact, ID genes really seem to be more enriched in layer five um, quite, quite substantially, which I'm not showing here, but in, is in the paper in adults. So, you know, are these predictive? Are they bullshit, right, essentially? Excuse my French. Um, and, and so, um, you know, if, if they're predictive, uh, these modules should, um, should be able to, uh, um, you know, that, that was based on 2012 data. So now we have a lot more data. We have uh, the paper from Sanders in 2015, which does an amazing job of aggregating all of the data and really providing a really strong case for um, uh, over 70 uh, de novo genes hit. There's the um, DDD study. And then uh, we recently put a study up on BioArchive about three months ago, maybe three or four months ago, sequencing, whole genome sequencing in the AGREE cohort. What's different about the AGREE cohort is there we have strong evidence for inherited, de no uh, inherited rare variation. And what's interested that's the iHeart at the top, and that was done in collaboration with Dennis Wall. And um, what, what Elizabeth and Laura found is that indeed M2 and M3 were enriched in that cohort, still largely driven by de novo genes, but that we also saw the signal again for M16 largely being driven by the inherited variation. Um, and and um, again, this is just looking at the later studies. In fact, the odds ratios now are in some of these cases are double what we saw before. What's interesting is the DDD um, is beginning to show enrichment and as some of those cases are clearly not autism. We, you know, they're not as quite as well 
clinically characterized. And as more and more um, exome sequencing is done to identify non-X-linked and other mental retardation genes, um, we, we can begin to see a, um, some enrichment in M2 and M3 in those ID genes, but it is definitely less enrichment than a kind of pure, pure autism cohort. This is from um, uh, the bioarchive paper where we asked if we look at those uh, mutations that are rare in um, high PLI genes um, that are transmitted only to affecteds and not to any unaffecteds, we can see that they form a, a strong direct and indirect. This is just showing the indirect PPI. You can see more of the data in that paper. And again, the BAF complex is all in blue up there. It's pretty remarkable, again, that's the neurogenesis cluster. But there are, of course, genes involved in other processes, and that's, that's shown here. Um, in fact, we find some non-coding regulatory mutations um, in DLG2. And in fact, the non-coding contribution, um, of course, generally is hard to see. But when we're, you know, we can find a large copy number variance, um, you know, relatively large. I mean, they're not... Uh, um, I mean, they're bigger than a single nucleotide. They're usually a few thousand base pairs. With, with whole genome sequencing, we're seeing um, more and more kind of first exons and promoters being removed and those kinds of things that we were um, um, not able to see before. And, and, and that's part of the story with the DLG2 and some of the, and we've, one of the other genes we identified called NRC32, which is right up there, uh, kind of midway, it's red. So that, um, is really heavily supported by, by non-coding variation as well. So, um, realizing that, yeah, so at the same time, we've also been doing single cell sequencing to begin to look at these things and begin to ask about, you know, is this glutamatergic neuron enrichment of genes really, you know, is it, is it specific? And this, again, this is a paper up in BioArchive, um, where we've split the cortex into um, marginal, you know, into its germinal zones below and the uh, zone above that we call the cortical plate that's really uh, containing the post-mitotic cells. And so uh, drop seek 40,000 cells. I'm just gonna go over this really quickly just to make a really quick point um, that autism genes are enriched in, in glutamatergic neurons. And, the, and, and, the, and this is showing the pattern of those that really are including quite a few lysine uh, demethylases and other uh, um, parts of the BAF complex as well. But there is some interneuron, and you know, it's not like it's, a, it's an exclusive thing. In fact, when we look more broadly now, um, you know, now that we have more genes, you know, you can see this is all of the risk genes that pass an FDR in the iHeart work um, uh, below 0.1. And, um, one can see that there is an enrichment in glutamatergic neurons for sure, but there's a group right above them that are kind of more panneuronal, was even more kind of weird to, you know, and then we find a gene like this ILF2 that's uh, very, very enriched in, in the radial glia, which is progenitors. We find two genes that are super enriched in parasites and that shows the same pattern in adults, and that's pretty remarkable. Um, how, you know, these are involved in setting the blood-brain barrier. So it's a couple genes that are doing that. And then one gene uh, that's enriched in oligoprogenitors uh, substantially. So again, there is a, a vector, you know, a kind of a large-scale signal pointing to a um, glutamatergic neurons as being an area of convergence, but it's by no means the kind of only story. And so one of the take-home messages is, yes, there's convergence on layer two, and I'm going to show this maybe a little later. Um, um, you know, um, superficial glutamatergic neurons, but one, if you're going to be modeling a gene, you want to look in the proper cell type in the proper environment, then it, it behooves you to use these kind of single cell data to, um, you know, you know, to guide that modeling more specifically. So again, just to you know, summarize this early cortical development. We have this kind of M2, M3 being transcriptional regulation, slightly later, but still prenatal upregulation of genes involved in, you know, that we broadly call synaptic development, but they're very distinct components of synaptic development. 
uh, that are fairly well defined now, and um, as well as a predominance in the superficial cortical layers. And I was very interested to, to hear about work that Arnold Krigstein's lab had done, single cell profiling in autism brain that was at Society for Neuroscience in a poster that I know has been submitted for publication, where they find in postmortem autism brain um, dysregulation of gene expression and a preferential loss of layer two, three neurons, which again would fit with this uh, picture, which where we're saying that it's the development of those layer two, three, and four circuits that are, you know, the superficial circuits that's affected. And maybe what the Krigstein lab is seeing is the manifestation of that in adult. That's a big maybe. But what this work in 2013 was kind of telling us that now I, you know, I, I inserted some of the more recent uh, um, single cell work was that, boy, we really need to understand what's going on here in terms of gene regulation and transcriptional regulation, that, that having maps of this and understanding the molecular architecture of brain development was going to be really critical. And so, again, if you think about it, what I've told you is that, and this is on the left is a figure from Jim Lupsky, and on the right is some work from ENCODE, just to, you know, that there's a kind of, you know, a transcriptional rubric that includes, you know, top tier chromatin transcriptional regulators that then filter through intermediate tier regulators and then affect, you know, the effectors, the gene expression in, you know, synaptic genes, the, you know, the, the business end of the cell in a way. Um, and what we're seeing, if you look at it from a kind of evolutionary and effects, uh, you know, um, um, a, a population genetic standpoint, the de novo large effect size mutations that are relatively new, those are primarily affecting transcriptional regulation. When you think about that from this standpoint of molecular function and hierarchies, you can see how that would filter through that those genes are going to have a larger effect by affecting kind of broader networks and that the synaptic development and function as a, as a group have kind of smaller effect sizes. So it really led us to this notion that genetic architecture parallels the molecular regulatory architecture. Again, not surprising, but, but comforting, but it really highlighted the need for refining and understanding these regulatory networks during cerebral cortical development. And that's where some of the psych encode, brain single cell work and other stuff has come in. It's not like nothing was known. I mean, there, there was quite a bit known about some markers of some of these cells and some of the things that drive them, especially oligodendrocyte progenitors and, you know, radioglia and intermediate progenitors. But, but really understanding this, you know, in a fundamental way in humans, there's, you know, just a ton to be done. So that kind of, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, realization in kind of around 2012 led us to begin to think about, okay, we need to make maps of this process. And this work has been led by the three people below. Started with uh, Jason Stein and Luis de la Torre Vieta, but then Hei Jung Wan came to the lab and uh, she led all of the chromatin interaction work using high c that I'm gonna talk about. And again, our notion is let's, let's separate the germinal zone from the post-mitotic zone because at least we know something about that biology already, so there should be some ground truth and some things we can test. But doing that would also allow us to query and understand neurogenesis, progenitor proliferation versus kind of post-mitotic development. And so what genes are expressed, what regions of the genome are active using chromatin accessibility studies, what genes do they regulate by looking at the three-dimensional structure and how do they regulate them looking at transcription factor binding site mapping. And that is kind of, you know, comes out now in this kind of series of, of the, the first two papers are published and they really do most of this, but the single cell work and the now EQTL work are, are both listed below on the bioarchive. So this is, um, you know, uh, Hei Jung's work and I, I realize I've been um, blabbing a lot. So, you know, the notion is that gene regulation occurs via chromosome folding that brings regulatory regions into contact with their target gene, and it's often not the closest gene. Um, and, it, and it does this in a tissue-specific manner. You know, we estimate that maybe 50% of the, of the interactions are to the closest gene, but 50% aren't. And so you can find, you know, by looking at this, we could identify these, this three-dimensional chromatin structure and gene loops that are um, mostly, but not exclusively, um, enhancer promoter interactions. They could represent other types of chromatin interaction, but we validate the high C and we find high confidence regions 
using other data, orthogonal data, like enhancer RNA, mRNA data that we got from a collaborator um, who's, who's working with the, um, um, uh, I'm spacing out on it, the, three prime, uh, the five prime race consortium, uh, Phantom, and um, as well as EQTL data. Only half of the GWAS loci seem to be acting on the closest gene. If we use these functional data, many would be predicted to be acting more than several hundred thousand bases away. It's a prediction. So this is just showing what we have there is the GWAS locus in pink, the credible SNPs. Um, I, uh, we used caviar. We get very similar results using painter and using the same SNPs picked by uh, PGC. And I'm trying to remember what, what, um, what method that was, but we used the, you know, Hei Jung used all three. Um, um, painter is a version of, of, of caviar. So we focus on caviar. Um, negative log 10 P value of the chromatin interaction is shown. The a cortical plate is in blue. The germinal zone is in green. Um, the FDR line of 0.01 is shown um, in the dotted line. And you can see that this would predict that there's a strong, strong, strong chromatin interaction occurring that's mostly um, cortical plate specific, um, which would make sense because the uh, cholinergic uh, receptor is a, in postmitotic cells primarily interacting with its promoter and not the closest genes. So you can see how this would be a way of, of sifting through complex loci to identify the most probable candidate genes. It's not a proof. But there's also another loci um, you know, that might be affecting this gene, PTK2B you know, um, as well, and that's in both the cells. So you know, some of these don't just identify one gene. So when we, um, when we now do this, and instead of taking LD blocks, which have nothing to do with the EQTL or function, um, but if we now kind of uh, stratify using this kind of method, taking, um, you know, we find pathways uh, that weren't identified before cortical neurogenesis and acetylcholine receptor activity are now significant. Because, and another thing we can do is we can ask, okay, if we take the credible SNPs as, as deemed by caviar, and now we take those that are either supported by high C or not, or supported by high C in a non-neural tissue, such as one might see in the IRMR90 cell, this is data from Bing Ren, ES cells and IRMR90, which is a fibroblast cell, or we took those that are in LD or the closest. Again, if we, you can see that using the high C uh, boosts the chance that we're going to identify, you know, that we're going to, that that gene is going to be a, um, that the target gene is going to be differentially expressed in postmortem schizophrenia brain. It's from the Common Mind Consortium. So it really shows the tissue, you know, the, the helpfulness of having the tissue and stage specificity, um, you know, as well as how this can kind of help annotate. It doesn't mean that the closest SNPs some aren't involved. It means that if you can have a close SNP with a high C or obviously with an EQTL, then that, that of course, is... is uh, a stronger candidate. This is just showing one of the things that we validated. There was a uh, 700 KB from the wrist snip was uh, the, it, it looked like it was a, um, the wrist snip area region was interacting with the Fox G1 promoter. So um, we um, uh, just CRISPRed out that uh, region. But before we did that, we did a luciferase reporter assay. So this is in a non-neural cell, but it shows that the risk allele reduces the reporter expression. Um, but more importantly, then in primary neural progenitors in vitro, do um, two different um, um, cuts around the um, around the site. Um, that's a you know that's an um, you know of the proposed uh, kind of enhancer that's within this uh, high C interaction zone. Um, we can show that it affects expression of Fox G1, but not not the closest two genes. This is just one of them shown here on the bottom, the PRKD1. So, you know, the high C is one type of data, but we, we really recognize that, you know, first of all, the high C regions are large. They're 5 to 10 KB, even, they're, you know, it's an expensive technology. So uh, doing a tax seq allows you to look at open chromatin, but it doesn't actually identify the physical looping that's identified by high C. But we reason that one could use the correlation of the reads at an enhancer 
with promoters to actually approximate that, that if an enhancer is regulating a promoter, their openness is likely to be strongly correlated. So Luis de la Torre Ubieda did ATAC-seq in the same kind of, um, um, in the exact same samples that we discussed uh, before, an N of three to four for each GZ and CP from fetal brain. So we identify peaks at the transcription start site. We find peaks with significant correlation across samples within a one megabase um, region. And we subset to distal peaks that show that are differentially accessible across lamina. Here we were interested in comparing GVZ versus CP to identify drivers, transcriptional regulators of these processes. And then we subset to the high C interacting regions. And this leads to kind of high confidence um, interactions, very high confidence. And this is just showing that, um, that the, the right genes are affected, that distal enhancers regulate genes that are enriched in the expected cortical lamina. So if we look at those peaks that are identified in GZ versus CP, um, those are genes, those are um, um, regulating genes that are enriched in the, shown in blue, in, in, in GZ, you know, in the, in the germinal zones, the, the ventricular zone, the ISVZ and the OSVZ, and intermediate zones still contain some, um, you know, uh, probably some pieces of the OSVZ. And then the green is the, uh, you know, post-mitotic zones. So, you know, there's a lot of data in this paper, and I just wanted to show a couple of functional examples that were pretty interesting. We were able to overlay these human enhancers in fetal development with enhancers that Jim Noonan's lab had previously identified in a science paper, Riley et al. in 2015, were... Um, human gained enhancers, gained on the human lineage. And one of them was an FGFR2. And FGF is a really interesting gene because FGF receptor, you know, we give FGF, and <laughs> FGF receptor is critical for neural progenitor proliferation. And so we found um, this enhancer that was supported both by um, the high c and the ATAC-seq. So we asked, you know, could we cut it out? And removing it in vitro, significantly reduced the FGFR2 levels using seven different guide RNAs. What was even more interesting is we could show that it actually reduced the progenitor number as predicted by altering progenitor self renewal. So it increased early cell cycle exit, early neurons, but in the end led to a kind of, you know, would lead to a kind of microcephaly in a way, a smaller brain. Another really interesting thing that, um, you know, that, you know, so the, I'm just showing two disease related things, but there's, and, and then I'll, I'll get close to ending. Patients exhibit, uh, patients with this, uh, there's a, a chromosomal break that induces microcephaly and the MRI is shown here. It was a large family that had several affected individuals. And, and you know, we had been looking through all of the kind of known neurogenesis and progenitor proliferation genes. And we'd found this set of predicted distal, five distal enhancers that were really far from this gene EOMS, which is TBR2. And um, what we reasoned is that even though TBR2 is not mutated here, that this chromosomal breakpoint shown in the middle in the dotted line would remove these enhancers and that would be the mechanism. And you can see the ATAC-seq below in green and the high c below that and you can see that several of these high C peaks directly overlap. And so we took the directly overlapping um, couple, I'm going to show you one, and, and, and removed it in neural progenitors. And so there's the um, tagging. And that's what happens to eOMS. Removing that distal enhancer that's supported by high C and ATAC C leads to an almost 80% reduction. So here's a genomic rearrangement that doesn't affect anything of the structure of the gene itself, but removes a very distal enhancer, something that's hundreds of KB away from the actual gene. And that's sufficient to cause the disorder. So I thought that was really remarkable. Another thing we can do is of course, take these, you know, the fetal brain peaks, adult brain peaks, those that are more in CP, more in neurogenesis zones like GZ, and ask, you know, in partition heritability using LD score regression. And so, so what we can do is take the GWAS, partition it into these regions, and then ask, you know, you know, you know where. So, so we took actually adult brain data that was from 
uh, Pat Sullivan and Greg Crawford, um, um, as well as DNA hypersensitivity data, it overlapped really strongly, that they produced for the psych encode and the fetal brain peaks, um, publicly available data, and we then partition the heritability, and one can see that there's a strong enrichment both for adult and, uh, and uh, fetal for schizophrenia, but you know, even, even, even for depressive symptoms spelled wrong, we get um, you know, some enrichment in fetal brain peaks, ADHD, intracranial volume, not surprising. Um, so so uh, interesting. Um, and uh, what was more interesting is that when we took the fetal part and asked for those that are progenitor enriched, in other words, driving early progenitor expansion, neurogenesis, and those that are post-mitotic, most of the risk, not all of it, but most, you know, we could see a much stronger signal in, in the early neurogenesis. So again, it, this highlights early neurogenesis. Um, again, this is just based on the ataxic fetal open chromatin as a kind of critical window for uh, disease, um, you know, and uh, cognitive phenotype susceptibility and, and regulation. So. so the last thing I'm gonna talk about is just the fetal EQTL study that we put on BioArchive about two weeks ago, or maybe three weeks ago. This was driven by a grad student in the lab as well as Jason Stein, who's now at UNC Chapel Hill. He started this by collecting most of these brains and Rebecca did, did all the kind of analysis. So um, we have 2,000 mid-gestation fetal brains, ribo zero RNA sequencing, close to 16,000 genes. We um, have uh, SNP genotyping from, I think, I think it's the Omni 2.5, imputed into the 1,000 Genomes Reference Panel. So we discover EQTLs using fast EQTL. We also use leaf cutter for splice QTL. There, there really no, there's no splice QTL resource at all for fetal brain. And then we can begin to do the same kinds of studies that we've done before, looking for functional enrichment, cell type specificity. Um, we can look across tissues and age, how specific are these QTLs? And, um, and then we can begin to look at disease association, as well as perform TWAS. The previous TWAS that we um, were lucky enough to collaborate with Sasha Gusev's uh, lab, um, Hey Jung and I, you know, was an amalgamation of mostly adult tissues and mostly non-neural tissues. So we thought maybe using the fetal tissue, where we, we know that a substantial amount of GWAS, you know, of, of the heritability partitions into would be worthwhile. So if we look at the e-genes, um, we can see that they're strongly overlapping adult, but they're, um, you know, again, this is showing the stage specificity of the EQTL. And if we look, you know, there are a lot of, you know, um, things that we can look at, and I'm just summarizing, you know, a, a couple things. One is that um, there's a slight enrichment. Um, this is a false discovery rate corrected p-value um, of genes that are constrained um, that are fetal specific QTL versus those that are shared in two or more GTEx tissues. Again, this fetal period is just very vulnerable time, likely. And, you know, uh, Rebecca's done a ton of work. I urge you to take a look at the paper because, you know, a lot of validation work. But what I wanted to show here is the disease related stuff that we're able to get out of this. Um, <clears throat> she ran WGCNA and identified. Um, uh, fetal modules that are highly overlapping with the previous modules, well replicated, um, enriched for PPI, et cetera. And we can see is if we partition the, re the, the recent PGC um, GWAS into, um, you know, you know, into overlapping EQTL, basically by overlapping the LD regions at this point, we can see that um, there's just one module, a yellow module, that's enriched in, in autism uh, GWAS. And what is that module? It turns out to be a module. The yellow is enriched for fetal upper neuron. This is showing all of our modules and their cell type specificity and enrichment. And this is the fetal upper neuron module. So it really fits with what we'd seen before in Neil Parikshak's 2013 paper, which used adult data. This is showing that indeed it's involved in the proliferation of, of progenit, you know, of, of, of the, uh, um, I'm sorry, the early formation of the upper layers of the cortex. Um, another thing that we thought was really interesting is that the splice QTLs carried substantial disease risk. 
So again, we can look in kind of, um, you know, different window sizes. I think this one is 500 base pairs around each, each uh, SNP. Um, and, you know, so you can see that both schizophrenia is, is enriched in fetal EQTL and SQTL. And, um, but what's interesting is that some of the, dis, some of the things like educational attainment show kind of more of, a, more of an effect of the splicing. Same thing with autism um, and ADHD, um, um, there's a trend as well. So it's interesting that, you know, kind of at least as much, you know, I would say, I would posit this, this is early days, but that there's a lot of risk in things that are regulating splicing. And with these data, we're also able to identify the splicing factors that are binding to these regions and identify, um, you know, the kind of splicing networks that are gonna be disrupted. This is just showing that the, the, the splice QTL is not dependent on the risk on the window size, like we go all the way from, uh, you know, 500 base pairs all the way, um, you know, so we changed the window sizes just to show that the enrichment stayed kind of over a reasonable set of window sizes. As you start getting really big, um, you stop, um, actually, you know, it stops having any meaning. But this is showing that there's actually an enrichment in the, in the um, oh, I'm sorry, this here is, is the EQTLs and it's comparing the enrichment in the adult versus the fetal EQTLs. And the EQTLs are the GTEx EQTLs. And the sample sizes are relatively similar. So again, it's showing that there's a, a, a slightly greater enrichment in fetal than in adult, which is consistent with the work based on the ATAC-seq. But the ATAC-seq doesn't have this kind of functional um, genetic variation versus uh, transcript abundance. So to kind of summarize, I, I think we have the methods now to efficiently interrogate interchromosomal interactions, open chromatin and the effects of human allelic variation on gene expression and splicing to begin to inform functional analyses that, at the tissue and stage specific level. And, and you know, my kind of view of this is that they kind of provide a map, a starting point, a, a, a scaffold for understanding the target of disease related non-coding variation could also turn out to be quite important in identifying um, you know, um, um, genetic variation in non-coding regions as well. And that's, you know, as WGS is broadly implemented, the maps will be useful in assigning non-coding variants to genes. And um, they can be applied to understand the most vulnerable epochs and cell types across brain disorders. So, um, you know, I wanna, I, I'm, I'm gonna skip this for time, but just the point is we can use these maps to validate our in vitro systems. And so certainly these periods of early neurogenesis are, I think we have quite valid systems for looking at them. We have issues around maturity that have to be addressed, but I think these early neurogenesis till about 25 weeks gestation are well modeled um, in vitro, both in 2D and in 3D cultures. So in conclusion, a fine grained understanding of gene regulation during human brain development is essential to understand the functional impact of human genetic variation and that these integrative approaches help organize um, and, and provide a kind of principle or framework for understanding molecular phenotypes in the brain and defining points of potential convergence in disease. So I think we can say, you know, that autism risk genes identified to date converge on early fetal brain development. Of course, we only know, we've only identified a small proportion of risk, but what's been identified so far are those things with the largest effect size, including the common variants with largest effect size. And those seem to affect brain development during the peak of neurogenesis involving transcriptional regulation and synaptic development and impact in glutamatergic neurons. I mean, the thing that I, that I didn't emphasize enough there is that that yellow module, that enrichment is both in autism rare variation and in GWAS. And we see the same thing for a different module for schizophrenia, that the rare variation that's acting seem, you know, seems to be enriching in the same, uh, same uh, uh, modules during fetal development. And that might be because maybe common variation that's acting very early um, is gonna have a relatively, um, you know, you know, you know, there's quite a bit of downstream effects on, on subsequent neural development. But um, as I said, this includes risk imparted by common variants, which also implicate these upper layer glutamatergic neurons, which is kind of the first time so, you know, previously we've just been, you know, relying on all the de novo hits by being able to use the LD score regression framework 
we can, you know, and partition the heritability across, you know, different functional annotations. We can say, indeed, that this module that's enriched in chromatin um, and transcriptional regulation in upper layer glutamatergic neurons is enriched in, in common uh, risk. So, and, and, and so um, I have to thank all the, all the collaborators, um, um, Dennis Wolf, you know, on, this, on the sequencing project. Um, I mentioned most of these people as we went along. Neil is now a neurology resident at UCSF. Mike has his own lab, Vivek has his own lab, Grant has his consulting firm. Jason and Heijung are at UNC Chapel Hill as assistant professors. Um, Luis is here at UCLA. Rebecca is a fourth year graduate student in the lab and Damon is a, uh, is a postdoc who, did, who led the, uh, the single cell work and Chris Hartle has been behind the scenes on a lot of these analysis and um, he's a grad student um, in, in bioinformatics. So, um, so anyway, I thank you. Uh, for your attention, um, I'm, I, I'm open for questions. Uh, sorry for, for, for being long-winded. Not a problem, the time is perfect. Dan, thank you so much for that very fascinating talk. Um, there one, there's one question right now in the chat box. Um, if you can see it, great. If not, I'll read it off. Can you, can you see it? Yeah, is, um, let me see. Uh, questions in, in, in Q box, please. I, Q &A. There's a Q&A box, I think. Where, where would that be? Um, down at the bottom, there's a folder that says Q&A. Okay. Um, oh, Q&A, I got it, I see. Okay, I didn't see that before. Yep, so there's a question from Carolina, Carolina Copy. Well, I opened it and, and, and it doesn't have anything in it, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, so the question is, do you think there are different genes or pathways involved with the three different domains that you showed in the first couple of slides? Remember, you had that stereotype. Yes. 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 I, so I, yes. I do think that there, um, it doesn't mean that there isn't shared as well, just like there's shared risk across disorders. There's going to be shared risk and distinct risk. And um, because the, you know, social cognition, let's take, and repetitive behavior or language, those involve complex neural circuits that involve specific regions of the brain. And those regions have some overlap, some of the same regions but also have some distinct uh, components. And so um, it's likely that distinct genetic variation is gonna affect the components that are distinct and that the, the um, you know, some of the shared, you know, some of the shared risks. So, you know, I look at it like in, in that initial cartoon that was in this small review that I wrote now almost uh, 12 years ago, um, it shows a teeter-totter and you can see that it depends on the size of the risk variant. And the notion is that if you have a really big risk variant, it might push you over the contour in many of those things because the big risk variant is affecting multiple systems. It's like an early developmental patterning thing that kind of screws up the whole cortex or layer two. That's likely to have a pretty you know, profound effect and not be that, that subtle. Whereas the common genetic variation that impacts social cognition, I would say, the, you know, the strongest effect size common loci that affect language and those that affect social cognition are likely to be distinct, um, um, you know, or have many distinct components. That doesn't mean there won't be some things that overlap, but yeah. Good. Um, a question for me, if I could. Um, so, you know, we've heard for decades that schizophrenia is a neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, do you buy this? And, and if so, given the increased understanding we have of the molecular, of various molecular developmental processes in the brain, what do you reckon that actually means? Yeah, I mean, it means that there might be a whole new, yeah, so I do buy it. Um, you know, it depends, you know, um, you know, at some level, everything's a neurodevelopmental disorder, even neurodegeneration to some extent. Um, but, but um, you know, schizophrenia, uh, you know, to me doesn't seem like a neurodegenerative disorder, let's put it that way. And so I think the neurodevelopmental framing was very pressing. Um, and um, number one, um, number two, I think that it points to, you know, perhaps their windows of vulnerability were very, very different kinds of interventions than uh, molecular or otherwise that are being done now could be applied because these pathways are, are quite different 
than the pathways that are implicated, you know, by the drugs that are effective once somebody is psychotic um, or, you know, or has a diagnosis. So it does make me think about maybe using these data to under, you know, as a way to kind of bridge um, between kind of what happens during very, very early development, where, where right now it might be uh, too much to ask to intervene, to kind of, you know, slightly later when um, certain susceptibility signs and prodromal signs might be coming out. And, it, you know, perhaps at those times, the genetics is pointing us to pathways that where the intervention would have to, would likely come a little bit earlier. In other words, not when the person manifests the disorder, but before manifestation, um, and that that all that creates a lot of a uh, lot of you know problems in a way, right? Um, 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 you know, I'm not saying it's easy, but um, so I, so I would almost guess that many of the things that we're identifying, not all, but many of the things that are being identified as the kind of developmental components where common variation is kind of you know residing are not things that are going to lead to targets necessarily that are going to be good for a patient who's 25 who is being, you know, their second hospitalization for mm -hmm. you know, psychosis that, that it's, you know, that a kind of, you know, using the genetics and other uh, prodromal factors to identify patients in an earlier phase. That, that's where these risk uh, factors are likely acting. That would be my guess. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, it does make sense. And all right, so we're, we're well past time, but um, I, and there are no more open questions right now. Dan, listen, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate you taking the time to give us such an interesting, comprehensive and up-to-date lecture. So thank you so much for taking the time. And that's it for um, this, this edition of the Site Genomics Consortium Worldwide Lab Consortium. Thank you for yeah, the thank opportunity. You so much. Thanks for the opportunity, bye. Everybody have a happy holiday.